Williamsburg, Virginia. That's our schedule over the next few hours. Thanks for being with us. Up next, historian and sociologist Robert Nisbet speaks at the 17th Jefferson Lecture sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities. His topic, the present age and state of the community. Good evening. I'm Lynn Cheney, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the 17th Annual Jefferson Lecture. This lectureship is the highest award that the federal government bestows for intellectual leadership in the humanities. And it's a happy occasion for those of us at the endowment to be able to recognize excellence in these disciplines to which we are devoted. When I'm asked to explain, as I am rather often, why the humanities are valuable, I often speak of the comfort, the solace, the reassurance that these disciplines provide. They link us to other minds in other places. They give coherence to our lives. They are an aid to perspective, helping us, in Matthew Arnold's words, to see life steadily and to see it whole. But the humanities have another aspect as well, a more unsettling one. They set forth thoughts that provoke, notions that challenge, ideas that shake us loose from comfortable patterns of thought. And it is this aspect of the humanities that I suspect tonight's lecturer will illustrate for you. In fact, I think you are going to be amazed at just how provocative this scholarly and courtly gentleman can be. But I'm getting a little ahead of the game, really uh, overstepping my bounds here. It isn't the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities that chooses the annual Jefferson Lecturer, nor is it the fine staff of the endowment. It's the National Council on the Humanities, a board of 26 distinguished private citizens. And so each year, the Jefferson Lecturer is formally introduced by a member of the National Council. Making the introduction this year is a council member whose term on the National Council is almost over. And all of us who have had the pleasure of working with her are going to miss her greatly. No slouch at the business of being provocative herself, Gertrude Himmelfarb is a scholar of powerful intellect, elegant style, and unfailing wit. The weather around Himmelfarb's work, one critic has written, is one of tolerance, curiosity, engagement, and rigor. Getting to know Professor Himmelfarb and working with her has been one of the greatest personal and intellectual pleasures of my two years as chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And so it's a great pleasure for me to present her to you tonight. Here to introduce the 17th Annual Jefferson Lecturer is the distinguished professor of history of the City University of New York Graduate School, Gertrude Himmelfarb. There are some professors, not many, but some, who have had careers as distinguished as that of Robert Nisbet, professor of sociology at Berkeley, dean of liberal arts at the University of California at Riverside, visiting professor at the universities of Bologna at Princeton University, Smith College, professor at the University of Arizona, and finally, one of the most coveted appointments in academia, Albert Schweitzer Professor of the Humanities at Columbia University. There are, as I say, a few academics who have attained similar professional distinctions, but there are far fewer who have had careers as intellectually distinguished as Robert Nisbet's. Mr. Nisbet's 20 or so books cover an extraordinary range of subjects, which is why at Columbia he had a joint appointment in both the history and sociology departments, and could as appropriately have had appointments in philosophy and political science as well. I myself would be hard put to choose among his many books, the few that I can uh, bring to your attention this evening, so I am willing to acquiesce in his own selection of those that he thinks have been most influential. 
the quest for community, the sociological tradition, social change and history, twilight of authority, history of the idea of progress, and prejudices, a philosophical dictionary. I cannot resist, however, adding one other book published 17 years ago that is as pertinent today, uh, perhaps more pertinent, certainly more urgent, uh, than it was when it was written, and that is The Degradation of the Academic Dogma. These titles give only a small idea of the breadth of thought encompassed by Mr. Nisbet's work, and an even smaller idea of the depth of thought. No less impressive is the consistency and centrality of thought. From his first book, The Quest for Community, published 35 years ago, to his most recent book, Fresh Off the Press, The Present Age, there is one overarching theme, which is nothing less than the state of Western civilization. The ideas and institutions that shaped it, the traditions and social arrangements uh, that for so long sustained it, and the ideas and forces that for a century or more, and uh, increasingly so in recent years, have threatened to subvert it. Almost any of his works may illustrate that theme. But since Mr. Nisbet, I understand, will be alluding to the idea of progress in his lecture this evening, and since his book on that subject happens to be one of my favorites, I would like to say a few words about his history of the idea of progress. William James once distinguished between the once-born and the twice-born. The once-born, simple, innocent, believing in a beneficent God and a harmonious universe, the twice-born, self-critical and self-conscious, having a tragic sense of life, acutely aware of the potentialities of evil in society, suspicious of the treacherous simplicities of grand ideas. Mr. Nisbet is preeminently a twice-born man. And it is as such knowing everything that can be known against the idea of progress, that he has urged us to reaffirm that idea. Not to be sure the simplistic, utopian, antinomian idea of progress fostered by some self-styled, enlightened thinkers Quote, belief in the value of the past, conviction of the nobility, even superiority, of Western civilization, acceptance of the worth of economic and technological growth, faith in reason and in the kind of scientific and scholarly knowledge that can come from reason alone, and finally, belief in the intrinsic importance, the ineffaceable worth of life on this earth. These premises, it seems to me, are central not only to the idea of progress, but to the idea of a humane civilization and a humanistic culture. And it is for this reason, I think, that they are appropriate and appropriate prelude to the 17th Jefferson Lecture in the Humanities, sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities. As it happens, this Jefferson lecturer was himself, not so long ago, a member of the Council of the Endowment, which gives an added fillip to his appearance this evening. As an old friend and admirer, an admirer, and uh, I am uh, happy to say, long before I had the privilege of making his acquaintance, I now have the pleasure of introducing Robert Nisbet, who will speak on the present age and the state of community. Mr. Nisbet.
thank you so very, very much, Professor Himmelfarb, for your most generous and most gracious and warm and eloquent words. And I want to thank also <coughs> Dr. Lynn <coughs> Cheney, Chairman of the Endowment, for the letter of invitation from her and for the many kindnesses since. There's a story out of the Merchant Marine of an old sea captain. He was much loved by his crew, but he had one idiosyncrasy, which consisted whenever he was giving instructions in the morning to the crew, he would frequently stop, look puzzled for a moment, bolt into his nearby cabin, come out in a few seconds and resume the instructions. Well, prying eyes discovered that when the old skipper went into his cabin, he advanced quickly on his desk, pulled a key out of his pocket, opened a drawer, looked quickly at the contents, locked it and came back and resumed the instructions. The time came when the old captain died at sea. His loving crew buried him and as soon as he had been buried in the sea, there was one thought on everybody's mind. What was in that drawer? And when they got the drawer open, they discovered a single sheet of paper. And on that sheet of paper were the words, starboard right, port left. <laughs> and I, it's, by way of saying that after Dr. Cheney's letter came, I suffered from a similar idiosyncrasy. I knew that she had written it, but I can never remember that it had been written to me. <laughs> what follows is about half history and half Jeremiah. I will be concerned with one major event, World War I, one renaissance, that of the 1920s in America, and one idea the idea of a national community. I hope to establish to your reasonable satisfaction the historical connectedness of these three topics, but if I don't, there should be a little nostalgia in the first two at least. The present age began with the First World War, the Great War as it is still called and for excellent reason. Its consequences pursue us yet. First, the 74 years war and still counting of which the Second World War was an episode, albeit a large one, and possibly destined to become the West's Second Hundred Years' War. The second consequence, totalitarianism, which we were so long in comprehending and which has served as the dynamo of the aforementioned 74 Years' War. Third, permanent terror systematically applied by the state to both citizens and aliens. Fourth, the third world are those considerable parts which are the disjectum member of the old European empires. Fifth, the continuing fiscal crisis in the West. And finally, the transformation of American society, of the American Commonwealth. There were really two first world wars, Europe's and America's. For Europe, it was a civil war, poisoned by racial and ethnic hatred. It was, strictly speaking, the last European war. For the Second World War, it would be a struggle of universal ideologies, democracy, communism, and fascism, more that than it was of nation states fighting over dynastic successions, boundaries, and economic rivalries, though I wouldn't take those entirely away from the Second World War. The First World War was a bloody one for Europeans. 12 million killed in action, 25 million wounded, incalculable destruction of architecture and landscape. Sometime in 1919, according to Martin Gilbert, official biographer, Churchill jotted down some impressions of the sheer savagery of the war just concluded. He finished with the words, when it was all over, torture and cannibalism, were the only two expedients that the civilized scientific Christian states had been able to deny themselves, and they were of doubtful utility. 
A German named Spengler spent the war writing a book that would receive the title Decline of the West. It was published just in time to festoon German bookstore windows for the edification of the German soldiers straggling home after the armistice. Other epitaphs of the European war were goodbye to all that, the magic mountain, the desert of love, the future of an illusion, case of Sergeant Grisha. W.R. Ng, the Dean of St. Paul's, gave the Romaine's lecture in 1920, his subject, the idea of progress. Afterward, he said to a friend, there, I believe I have spat sufficiently on the filthy superstition. But it was a very different kind of great war for America. It was the most popular war that the United States has ever fought. That is, once we were in it. As you know, there was great debate before as to whether we should. We were in the war for only a year and a half. Our losses were light, relatively. 48,000 killed and 240,000 wounded. Not a shell or bomb landed on American soil. Despite those benefices, the war had a virtually traumatic effect on American society and consciousness. Prior to 1914, America was probably the most decentralized, deployed, and dispersed, and also regional and local, a government among all the Western nations. When European scholars and statesmen, including Lord Bryce, who loved America, professed to be unable to find either a genuine sovereign in the American Constitution, they said, neither is there a theory of the state. Those are Bryce's exact words. In truth, the average citizen's only contact with the federal government prior to the Great War was through the postman. I recall that the income tax had been ratified the year before 1913, but most Americans hadn't had contact with it that early in 1914. All this began to be changed on a massive scale once we declared war on Germany in April, early April 1917. In the extraordinary, in an extraordinary and unprecedented series of laws, Congress turned over government, economy, social organization, and indeed individual <coughs> consciousness to the President Woodrow Wilson. Railroads, the telegraph and telephone, the shipping lines, munition factories, and mines were nationalized. A war industry board was given total power over all aspects of production civil and military. A war labor policies board fixed ruled labor and set wages. A food administration governed production and consumption of food in all cases bypassing state and local governments in their operations. That was only the beginning. Believing that <clears throat> the hearts and minds of the people were vital to the kind of war, that is, moral crusade, Wilson intended to wage, Wilson set up a national corps <coughs> of so-called four-minute men, 75,000 strong before the war ended. Each four-minute man was entitled to invade any public meeting, religious or lay, and speak for not less than four minutes on the holiness of the war. Beyond this innovation in thought management, there was a considerably larger group a picked Americans, which for want of a better label, was known as neighborhood watchers. Their instructions were to listen for and report any conceivably disloyal remarks made in their own respective neighborhoods. As Samuel Morrison has written, it was a wonderful opportunity to bring patriotism to the aid of neighborhood feuds and personal grudges. In 1917, at Wilson's request, Congress passed the Espionage Act, under which individuals found guilty of impeding war conscription or challenging national patriotism could be sent to federal prison. When that seemed not to suffice, Congress passed, again at the President's behest, the Sedition Act. This struck at publicly expressed sentiments on the propriety of American engagement. Victor Berger, the first socialist ever elected to Congress, 
and whom Congress refused to seat. And the notable labor leader, Eugene Debs, were among those sent for long sentences to federal prisons for publicly questioning American entry into the war. The Justice Department under A. Mitchell Palmer began raids, most of them without judicial warrant, early in the war, ostensibly to catch German spies, <clears throat> though no one German spy was ever actually found. Uh, such. The raids continued into 1920, given justification then by fear of socialists who had perhaps entered the United States among other Eastern European immigrants. Prior censorship of the press was considered but dismissed in favor of powers given the Postmaster General to open all second and third class mail and to instigate charges against publishers and writers deemed disloyal. All over America, in school districts, textbooks <coughs> through high school were examined for German content, and all such, no matter what its age and innocence of war, was cut, cut from the books. To this day, it is not altogether clear why Wilson conducted so thorough, so saturating a crusade within American society which had taken to the war almost immediately and reached perhaps the high point of voluble patriotism in our history. Wilson himself said, it is not an army we must shape, it is a nation. But why? There was a considerable fear of German spies and the sizable contingent of German Americans suffered a good deal of persecution. But even so, why, in Wilson's words, shape a nation. It is hard not to conclude that Wilson was engaged by intent in two wars. The first, the war against Germany. The second war against what his passionately patriotic soul regarded as the hateful impurities in America the Beautiful. Impurities of language, of psychological and cultural loyalties, even genetic impurities all resulting from the mass immigration of the turn of the century. Wilson shared Theodore Roosevelt's hatred of what T.R. had called hyphenated Americans. The first quarter of the 20th century was one of unprecedented interest by middle-class Americans in eugenics and strict regimens of Americanization classes, along with state laws forbidding miscegenation. Wilson, like T.R., wanted the melting pot to be kept bubbling at highest temperature, and a good many of his measures, which are hardly ex explicable in terms of the German menace, I think can best be explained in those terms. Second, there was Wilson's well-recorded love of the state, on which he had written an influential, published an influential book titled The State in 1889. His later book, The New Freedom, echoed this love of the national state and what Wilson saw as its liberating, its peculiarly liberating powers. It was in the interest of the new freedom that Wilson, like other progressives, argued the cause of a national state that would enter ever more deeply into the lives and minds of Americans. The Wilson War State ended almost as abruptly as it began. Congress called back its powers. Dismantling began immediately. Suddenly the four minute men were gone. So were the neighborhood watchers and the cutting up of textbooks. Gone too, thank heaven, were meatless Tuesdays, sugarless Wednesdays, butterless Fridays. And also those ridiculous glass bowls in every respectable parlor in which for no reason anybody ever seemed to know the tinfoil of cigarette and gum packages was patriotically saved and flaunted to all callers. Yes, it was good to see our boys beginning to come home when it was over, over there. It was good to think of the status quo ante bellum returning, that is normalcy. Fortunately or unfortunately, that status quo never returned to the United States. 
all pretenses and presidential speeches to the contrary. America had become a nation beyond anything that had existed before, a nation in government, economy, and moral consciousness. There was the 18th Amendment as if to signalize the new role of the national state in its prohibition of liquor. That was in 1919. In the following year came the 19th Amendment, signalizing the loss of states' rights in set setting the criteria of voting eligibility, which means the women enfranchisement. Quietly but substantially, the post-war Congress and executive gave much more of itself to activities such as education, social welfare, even crime enforcement, and in the use of the Federal Reserve and the Federal Trade Commission, each of which had been created under Wilson just before the war broke out. In summary, the American people merged with the American national state for the first time in their history. No longer did Bryce insist in his American Commonwealth in the later editions that America had no theory of the state. Moreover, a considerable nostalgia for the war was in evidence by 1921-22. There had been, as one thought about it, some very good things about the war. The economy had yielded high profits, high wages, better working conditions, and virtually full employment. A new kind of individualism had come into being that was not without its delights. An individualism directed not at the central government as of yore, but at such old authorities as the family, church, local community, and the venerable codes of morality. A new informality of dress, manners, and conversation that entered American life. Dress, especially for women, became more experimental. So did the female lifestyle, which could now include cigarettes and cocktails and shorter dresses. Millions of Americans learned during the war what kings and generals had known for countless centuries, that the very military discipline of a war induces a kind of slackness and indifference in the non-military authorities of public opinion and popular manners. The war also had a special flavor of community that was collectively fulfilling. Old moral values grown stale had been reaffirmed and in the process rejuvenated. No wonder the war had been, as the next world war would definitely not be, a singing war on the home front and over there alike. It had been a war of parades, rallies, and innumerable picnics. One's favorite Hollywood and Broadway stars sang, danced, and pleaded for bond sales. The First World War had been for many Americans a most welcome surcease from monotony, boredom, from the long littlenesses of ordinary life, as Rupert Brooke put it. The thrills and satisfactions of a good war well fought which William James had recognized and sought to harness in his famous essay, The Moral Equivalent of War, were being sorely missed by more than a few Americans by 1921. More and more editorial writers and contributors to popular magazines were waxing thoughtful about the good things that had gone with the nation at war, such things as discipline, fraternity, equality, and compassion. The truth was, Americans were feeling in some measure a kind of spiritual vacuum. Nobody relished the killing, the carnage, and the devastation of war, but it had to be admitted that the late war had provided a novel sense of national unity, of liberation from extreme factionalism, and above all, of national purpose. It might even be certain of the educated bethought themselves that the war, most especially the forced stay of two or three million young Americans in Europe, would have a civilizing effect upon America, notoriously mired in the mentality of villages and farms. Matthew Arnold had lamented the lack in England of a standing army like those on the continent, simply on the basis of what he called the civilizing effects 
of a national army. Not least, there had been a suspension during the war of class conflicts in the economy and the factionalism that went with political democracy. Another Englishman, the philosopher L.P. Jacks, had once written, quote, of the spiritual peace that war brings. It had been good to be rid of the bitter conflict between interventionists and isolationists. How fascinating, too, to have discovered the uses under the spur of war of economic and social rationalization of human relationships. In place of the jungle-like free market, there had been planning during the war, industrial, labor, all aspects of social living. Thus it was that early in the 20s there arose the slogan, we planned in war, why not in peace? That slogan lasted all through the 1930s, serving as the title of at least one book in my recollection and dozens of articles and editorials. The sense of unity was accompanied by, accompanied by a sense of progress in the whole body of American culture. This was not a strictly new sense. Bryce had referred to the fatalism of the multitude in America, the ingrained sense that America was exceptional in the world of nations, the consequence being a conviction that no matter what we may do for good or ill, somehow God will direct America to its rendezvous with the future. Mark Twain delighted and also flattered millions of Americans with his Connecticut Yankee at King Arthur's court and innocence abroad in which the stock rustic American, hayseed basically, was put in the grand feudal circumstances of traditional Europe in order to confound, baffle, and defeat them with native homespun know-how. This psychology fattened enormously as a result of the Great War. Americans decided instantly they had won it for the Allies. And for them, it was one more piece of evidence of the fact that Americans, real Americans that is, are born with know-how, can-do, and no fault, as no other people in the world was. Many an editorial or article in the 20s or, as I can well attest, many a conversation began with the words, the reason our boys were such good soldiers and able to vanquish the Germans so quickly is, there would follow explanations ranging from 2020 morality to the alleged fact that all American soldiers came off farms where there had been plenty of fresh milk and butter squirrel rifles to make each of them experts at 10, and the capacity to repair anything mechanical with a hairpin. <laughs> Magazines like the Literary Digest, I hope somebody else in the room remembers the old Literary Digest, the Saturday Evening Post, Collier's, Everybody's, McClure's, American, and the Review of Reviews, all widely read and influential in the 20s, carried frequent articles illustrating the progressive character of the American nation and the sterling qualities innate in each and every American, qualities making for almost effortless superiority when it came to the fuddy-duddies of Europe and the benighted heathen of the Orient. All of this would be and would have been at the time nothing more than a harmless, naive national conceit, but for one overpowering fact. Americans at all levels took it seriously. Thus from the conceit and utter untruth that the American soldier with but a few weeks of hastily organized precarious field training behind him outfought the European soldier and single-handedly won the war for the Allies, out of that came a military indolence that found us as badly prepared in 1941 as we had been in 1917. Two full years after World War II had begun in Europe. But the idiocy of belief in Native American know-how and can-do, together with no fault, 
is far from limited to our military consciousness. We see it in our system of public education, which until a couple of decades ago was automatically deemed by every honest-to-God American as the finest educational system in the world. In our manufacturing of automobiles, semiconductors, and weapons, and in the whole cult of the amateur, not least in national government and politics, where the alleged interest in the presidency, and I'm citing figures alive at that time, where in the alleged interest in the presidency, a small town newspaper publisher was thought to qualify, a manufacturer of automobiles in Dearborn received petitions signed by millions for him to drop what he was doing and be the president. Uh, these are, there are so many instances of the cult of amateurism, as I call it, in which we Americans, under the, under the conviction of innate know-how can do, will run from, will be thought running from a candy, running a candy store to being an overnight senator or president. The conjunction of the idea of national community and national progress was rich in symbolism to both the intellectual and the ordinary American. On many an office and living room wall hung the familiar, don't knock progress. In newspaper editorials, you can't stop progress was like something from the Ten Commandments. People were, for, were permitted a few tears when the bulldozer crumbled some architectural gem or ravaged a bosky hillside, but not too many tears, progress must go on. The French, doubtless to pay off some of their war debts, exported a lay religion known as Kuwaitism in the United States in the early 20s. The core liturgy was the repetition dozens of times a day to oneself Day by day, in every way, I am getting better and better. But how can you get better if you are born with know-how and can do? No, no one waited for an answer. But as if to confirm intoxication with progress came in the 1920s an authentic <coughs> cultural <coughs> renaissance. The connection union between war and renaissances is neither common nor uncommon in history. Before the greatness that was Greece came the Persian Wars, the grandeur of that was Rome, the Punic Wars. In the Italian Renaissance, the true Renaissance man was as adept in war as in art. There is nothing even probable about these conjunctions and sequences. The religious wars in Europe, the civil war in this country, and in Vietnam brought little, if any, cultural upthrust. The Hundred Years' War plunged Europe into a cultural barbarism it hadn't known since the early Dark Ages. Vietnam was accompanied by the manias of revolt that demeaned everything from ordinary cleanliness to language and civility. But to repeat, as both Toynbee and Kroeber make clear in their separate studies of the eruptions of high and creative culture, wars can be tonic to the creative impulse. This was certainly the case in the Great War in America. It is sad that we have fixed to the 1920s such labels as the Roaring Twenties and the Age of the Flapper. In literature alone in the decade, it compares favorably with that period in the 19th century that has won the label Renaissance, I mean the age of Melville and Emerson, where, and this I think is one of the most striking facts I have ever stumbled on, where in a single five-year period opening the 1850s, Emerson published Representative Men, Melville, Moby Dick, and Pierre, Hawthorne, The Scarlet Letter, and The House of Seven Gables, 
Thoreau published Walden and Whitman Leaves of Grass. And let us not forget another book in those five years, Uncle Tom's Cabin. That renaissance, it will have been noted, occurred on the eve of a great war. But then Clio is rarely tidy. Perhaps a pre-war made electric by something like abolitionism produces the same rhythms and depths of thought which that wars occasionally can. And after all, Mrs. Stowe's book did help mightily in starting a major war. The Renaissance of the 1920s may not have the sheer genius in it that the age of Emerson and Melville did, but it deserves more attention, and I mean as a culture phenomenon, not just strings of biographies of individual intellectuals and artists, but as a culture phenomenon, then as far as I know, it's getting. Hear me. There were novelists of the stature of stature, I'm talking about the 1920s decade, of the stature of Faulkner, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Dreiser, Dos Passos, Sinclair Lewis, Thomas Wolfe, Cousins, Willa Cather, Edith Wharton, Susan Glasgow. Poets of the decade included Eliot and Pound, Frost, Robinson, Stevens, Williams, Sandberg, Marianne Moore, Langston Hughes, and County Cullen. Critical essayists included Mencken, Edmund Wilson, Honecker, Paul Elmer Moore, Van White Brooks, Nock, Robert Penn Warren, John Crow Ransom. In drama, there was O'Neill. But it was not literature alone. The 20s Renaissance soared in two art forms, the only two art forms that America has ever resplendently exported to the entire world. First, music, that is jazz and second, the film. These swept the world within the decade and the names of Griffith, Chaplin, Swanson, Pickford, and Barrymore are still icons as are the names of Gershwin, Jerome Kern, Irving Berlin, Cole Porter, Wellington, Ellington, Armstrong, Tea Garden, and Bechet. The 20s was the decade, too, of the inauguration of America's civil religion, that is, spectator sports. Its heroes, Ruth, Dempsey, Grange, Tilden, Jones, Wills, and Ederly, still evoke a certain reverence. Perhaps the greatest of all athletes, male or female, Babe Didrikson, was in high school in the 20s getting ready. Every bona fide renaissance in history has representation from foreign vintages among its intellectual wines. The 20s was the period of the reception in full body of Einstein, Marx, and Freud. In no time at all, conversations among intellectuals were studded with relativity, Oedipus complex, and class struggle. Without doubt, the American idiom was affected by these intellectual imports. It remains an interesting question, though, whether they did more to the American idiom than it did to them. Think of Marx cowering today among deconstructionists at Duke or Yale. <laughs> Freudian tragedy reduced to the farce of therapeutic social activism and or permanent orgasm. And Einstein appears to have registered more influence in our morals, which would distress no end that deeply moral Victorian genius than upon theoretical physics. I'll come back in a moment to the thematic nature of the Second American Renaissance. First, let me point to one other, and here last, participant in the great flowering. I mean the political intellectual, and more to the point, the political clerisy. A clerisy is a body of intellectuals which may include philosophers, journalists, hierarchs, Gnostics, Mandarins, and so on, that surrounds some one major institution, the patriarchal family in the Orient, the Confucian and Neo-Confucian clerisy, the church in the Middle Ages, the political state in modern, in, in modern Western history. The mark of a clerisy is not in any unanimity of mind on creedal and doctrinal matters. It is rather the gigantic conviction 
that apart from the monolith it guards, civilized life of any kind is impossible. Hence the scrupulous and minute custodianship of the individual in the Middle Ages the when the communicant's life was under the inspection of the church from cradle to grave. And in the contemporary United States, it is the state, not the church, that contemplates each individual from conception to grave. Most renaissances are characterized by the appearance of political intellectuals and clerises, usually late in the twilight of the Renaissance. When the age of Aeschylus is over, Plato and Aristotle make their appearance. When the age of Michelangelo was coming to an end, there stood Machiavelli. The end of the great age of Shakespeare was signalized by Hobbes astride Leviathan. Prior to the First World War, America had few political intellectuals in the European sense. A true political clerisy was not to be found in Washington or New York. It was not a significant feature of American culture. We had had great statesmen by any standard among the founders, and at least a sprinkling of the great through succeeding decades. decades. But a clerisy, in the sense of a class of intellectuals devoted to the American national state and its enhancement, hardly preceded the turn of the century. Progressives, the, the 20th century progressives, and their real interest was efficiency, whether in industry, a national forest, or government, or where. Wilson was a one-man clerisy, both before and during the war. His book, The State, and especially his The New Freedom, written one year before the war broke out in Europe, established him securely as a political intellectual in the European sense. He was passionately in love with the American nation and equally passionate about the progress, uh, prospect of America reforming the world of giving the underprivileged nations an American illumination. He was a proud neutralist as long as he could believe that neutrality would give America the best opportunity for world leadership afterward. When in 1960 he began to believe himself wrong in that strategy, he became an overnight interventionist, distrusting even England and France so far as his belief in their knowledge and feeling for democracy was concerned. He invited, conscripted intellectuals and artists to serve and role in Washington. Among others, there were Isaiah Bowman from Johns Hopkins, Walter Lippmann, Charles Merriam, Carl Becker, Guy Stanton Ford, and the novelists Mary Roberts Reinhardt, Booth Tarkington, and Samuel Hopkins Adams. Artists included Joseph Pennell, and Charles Dana Gibson. In short, a corps who fought not with bayonets, but with pens and brushes, and fought effectively for all that. Thus in war, in the war state, was born the American political clerisy. There were those, including Randolph Bourne, who predicted that while the war would end, the war clerisy would never end. And he was right. Joining the political division of the Second Renaissance were such as John Dewey, Walter Lippmann, Charles Merriam, Beard, Stuart Chase, Herbert Crowley, editor of the New Republic, and indeed all the editors of the New Republic, Lewis Mumford, Van Wyke Brooks, just to name a few. Many did not even know one another. Certainly there, was no, there were no meetings, no pledges, no commitments. They were simply a group created largely by the inspiration of the Great War, that seen in strong, positive, and supreme national government of the war, a prototype once stripped of the war and the military. Moreover, as we see so plainly today, not only the political intellectual, but the literary artist of the Renaissance also played a vital role in the furtherance of national community. Quite simply, 
the themes of this particular Renaissance, and all Renaissances have themes. You remember your Burkhardt pointing out the theme of the Italian, themes of the Italian Renaissance, state as a work of art, the world of man, and so forth. The themes of this particular Renaissance were first, now these are all ideas, not necessarily valid, but these are the themes of the 20s Renaissance. First, the lost generation and with it the lost individual. Second, and connectedly, the eroding, fast disappearing American allegiance to the village, the church, and the extended family, thus creating a nation of lost individuals. Third, the insufficiency of the city in America as far as restoration of community was concerned, the city, cold, cheerless, impersonal, and anonymous. And fourth, the historical evolutionary necessity of the nation itself, and nothing less, becoming modern man's community, his refuge, and his hope. No single person embodied these themes more than did Don Dewey, John Dewey, the last American philosopher to be a household name. Dewey was obsessed by community all through his life. The result probably less of his birth and early nurture in a small Vermont town than the fact that he was for some years at the beginning of his career a devout Hegelian in his philosophy. Once a Hegelian, always a Hegelian seems to be a reasonable lesson of intellectual history. And although Dewey did indeed become America's supreme pragmatist, the Hegelian canon of community never left him. It was he, not Charles H. Cooley, who founded the pervasive theme of community at the University of Michigan. Dewey preceded Cooley by 10 years at Ann Arbor. When Dewey went to the University of Chicago and devoted himself for years to educational theory and experiment, his great and lasting message to the teachers of the classical curriculum, those who believed that the first priority went to the teaching of language and history and, and a lot, his first uh, conclusion and what he preached for years was the school is a miniature community, and so is each classroom. In the 1920s, Dewey, by then at Columbia, soared. One book featured what he called the lost individual in America. He was referring to middle-class America. In another, it was the public that was lost. The old unities are dying fast, he wrote, albeit without proof or documentation. Family, local community, church, mutual aid group, all dead or dying. They have been made moribund by the great society, the impersonal, soulless, icy great society brought in on the wings of technology and industrialism. Quote, the great society created by steam and electricity may be a society, but it is no community. The machine age in developing the great society has invaded and partially disintegrated the small communities of former times without generating a great community. What are the conditions for the great community? To approach more closely and vitally the I beg your pardon. What are the conditions for the great society to approach more closely and vitally the status of the great community? End quote. The literary great participated fully in the mission as described by Dewey, Lippmann, Crowley, and others. It is as though a great oratorio had been composed for the decade of the 20s, one titled perhaps Community Lost and Community Regained, one presided over by an invisible conductor. The first movement, a dirge, is titled The Lost Individual and the Lost Generation. Solos are presented by Scott Fitzgerald and Walter Lippmann. The second movement is called The Deserted Village, and here Sinclair Lewis, Sherwood Anderson, join Lippmann and Edgar Lee Masters in the quartet 
in which the tyrannies, decadences, and stultifications of Spoon River, Winesburg, Ohio, and Gopher Prairie are recited and with a celebratory hymn to Carol Kennicott. Then comes the drear and chilling movement, the city of dreadful night with its cruel exploitation and icy impersonality and perpetual death of the soul. Here we may imagine Theodore Dreiser as the soloist, aided by a special chorus of the University of Chicago Department of Sociology. <laughs> Finally comes the grand concluding movement joined in by all, the ascension, the annunciation, the soaring, thrilly, fin thrilling finale to the great community, the national state. It makes a great oratorio, all right. But since when have oratorios been the serious social philosophy, social science, and public planning that a commonwealth must in the long run depend upon? Was there, in fact, even the slightest empirical basis for the philosophical, literary, artistic, and journalistic themes of the 20s? <clears throat> Not much. But the power of an ideal type or stereotype is enormous. A stereotype is a half-truth, but like a half-brick, it can be thrown farther. And we should never forget the power wielded by the writing classes over the reading classes. Came the Depression in 1930, <clears throat> but the themes of the Renaissance persisted as Renaissance themes usually do in history. The idea of the great community had been born of war, nurtured in prosperity, and would now receive its toga virilis in another great war, this one Roosevelt's war against the Depression. There was no theory in the New Deal, which makes idle all efforts to connect it with Keynesianism, Fabianism, or any other imported is ism. In practical operational terms, FDR's New Deal structure was largely based on the exhumation of World War I structure with adaptations thereafter in unending procession. The spirit of the, New Deal, of the New Deal's NRA, shortly to be ruled unconstitutional, was a resurrection of Wilson's War Industries Board. Wilson's labor, na, uh, uh, National Labor Policies Board became FDR's National Labor Relations Board. The World War I Food Administration, which, been, which had ruled over both agricultural and food processing matters, came to life in FDR's AAA. Even some of the actors were the same. Hugh Johnson, who had run the draft under Wilson, ran NRA under Roosevelt. Bernard Baruch and Herbert Bayard Swope were, were among the considerable number who directly served the Great War and also the New Deal. The political fallout of the Great War and also the Renaissance was to be seen from the beginning in Roosevelt's administration. I am much indebted here to William Chambra, AEI scholar, for pointing out the skill and its sensitivity. This was in a paper of his several years ago. The skill and sensitivity with which FDR rang changes on both war and community while combating the Depression. In his first inaugural, he likened himself to a commander-in-chief leading, he said, a trained and loyal army, that is, the American people. I assume, he added, unhesitatingly, the leadership of this great army of our people dedicated to a disciplined attack upon our common problems. But it was not only the symbol of war invoked, but also that of the traditional neighborhood and village as Mr. Chamber points out, Roosevelt was careful to explain that the New Deal represented no more basically than an extending to our national life the old principle of the local community. To FDR's eternal credit, there were no moves made toward the use of four-minute men and neighborhood watchers. There were the Blue Eagle posters and celebrations, the evening marches through the neighborhoods for dimes, and above all, the president's fireside chats and his matchless oratory. 
Nor after the Second World War engaged the United States were their espionage and sedition acts passed. World War II did not militate in the slightest against the New Deal. Once shortly after Pearl Harbor, FDR said half-jokingly that it was time now for Dr. New Deal to be replaced by Dr. Win the War. But in truth, the two doctors worked very well together. Clausewitz had stressed the importance of something akin to a New Deal in his classic on war in the 19th century. He said that war is a continuation of politics. He might have added that politics in war is often a continuation of the quest for social justice. When the Second World War became appended to the New Deal, a renewed search for the old paraphernalia of World War I went on. New and ever-changing variations on the old War Production Board of 1917 were instituted overnight. Once again, though I think in less intensity, the spirit of national war community came to Americans. It may not have been a singing war as the first had been, and instead of neighborhood watchers, we had air raid block wardens gently persuading neighbors to keep a bucket filled with sand on the front porch. But a fresh infusion of the psychology of national community was apparent all the same. <clears throat> The substantive reality of a welfare state widened appreciatively in the 40s and 50s, prosperity notwithstanding. So did the vision of a national community in large and a spate of books. One more war crisis came in the 60s, war in Vietnam, probably the most unpopular war in American history, and also the by no means inconsiderable campus wars. It was in response to both wars that President Johnson created his celebrated Great Society in the 60s. Why didn't he choose to call it Great Community? Perhaps because a former school teacher just couldn't bear the thought of torturing the word community any longer. It will not have been missed that the history of the idea of national community has been governed in large measure by crisis. Three wars and a major depression, and therefore by crisis mindedness. Excuse me. <clears throat> so far as human thought is concerned, crisis has its value. It takes a crisis, even a mini crisis, to start most of us thinking, in contrast to musing or day daydreaming. But the spirit of crisis is not the ideal nursery for long-term public policy. Projects planned in times of war crisis tend to take on the centralization and nationalization of war. Tocqueville said, men who have a genius for centralization like war, and those with a genius for war like centralization. Had a body comparable to the Constitutional Convention in 1787 ever been convened to consider the welfare state for the long term, it is possible that we would have done better than we have, than we have under the lash of war and other crises. The appeal of national community is becoming stronger. It has inherited and gone beyond the luster that once attended the phrases planned economy and welfare state. Community has strong resonance, resonances. In his now famous speech in San Francisco in 1984, Governor Cuomo called for not simply a national community, but a national family. He said, I quote, we believe in a single fundamental idea that describes better than most textbooks in any speech what a proper government should be, the idea of the family. Mutuality, the sharing of benefits and burdens for the good of all, feeling one another's pain, sharing one another's blessings, end quote. 
The governor of New York literally electrified his party and became instantly a candidate for president, even though an undeclared and perhaps unwilling one. Of all evocations of community, family leads the way. Whether it is a steel mill, a gang of mobsters, or a legislative body, the reference to family tends to soften our vision. Family is indeed a noble institution, but only up to a point. It would be just as tyrannizing to cast a national state in the mold of a family as it would be to cast a household in the mold of the national state. There is some unintended humor also in this ledger domain of family and state. When the institution of the state first arose a few thousand years ago, it was in the context of war and on the ruins of the family, that is the kinship clan system. A great deal of Western political philosophy is built around the confrontation of family and state. In Plato, in the Roman lawyers, in Baudin, Hobbes, Rousseau, and others, the struggle between family and state is luminous. To call a national state a family may be, in addition to being dangerous nonsense, the supreme humiliation of the family by the state. The very word community, communitas, in the Latin was regarded as a quality noun by the ancient Romans. The conscript fathers of the Roman Republic never confused the familia with the res publica. But the Caesars, starting with Augustus, made it a ritual highlighted by the emperor's command that an image of himself be placed on every Roman hearth alongside the sacred lares and panates. Community is one of those siren-like, transfiguring, lulling, and disarming words of which we have so many in the English language. Community generates thoughts and feelings of intimacy, trust, love, devotion, and the removal of all the carapaces of the human personality. The greatest philosophers of absolute power have known this. Rousseau wrote admiringly, the most absolute authority is that which penetrates, is that which penetrates into a man's being, inmost being, and concerns itself no less with his will than with his actions. George Will has given this utilization of absolute power of the state for the entry into the deepest levels of the human mind, the highly apposite label of soul craft. If the national state is to become our family, what then befalls the household in which the vast majority of us live? When we become low in spirit, fearful of the odds, what do we do? Call our congressman? Spokesmen for the national community have had the wit to put it in a kind of progressive time series. We need not ask where the idea of progress has gone. It is alive and well in social science departments under the name usually of social evolution. The communitarians take a leaf from Karl Marx's book. Marx knew it was better to present socialism as inevitable than as merely nice. The national community is so dealt with, it is described as the modern emergent of a series that began with the local community, the church and the family in colonial times. Gradually, American democracy progressed through the Republican stage, the populist, social democratic, planned economy, and the welfare state. Today, this progressive tradition has reached, has culminated in the national community. The succession has been, in other words, not only historical, but logical, inevitable, deterministic. So it is believed. The utility of the purported developmental or progressive series through time is that certain unmistakable elements of the social presence, such as local community, church, and extended family, may therefore <coughs> be labeled <coughs> as obsolete, as mere survivals, wraiths, or ghosts of a departed past. The worst crime the intellectual can be found guilty of in our age is that of consorting with anything stamped with the past, that is, the traditional. Past equals bad, present good, and future best. 
Ergo, he who finds possible inspiration or even utility in the past is, quote, trying to set the clock back, the clock of inevitable progress. The quest for political community on a national basis will almost certainly add heat to the present controversy over the location of the true nidus of American democracy. Is it Congress or is it the presidency? from which will most likely come the greatest change, reform, reconstruction as we advance into the future, Congress or presidency. But as Robert Bork has been pointing out for some years now, a third contender has entered the lists of, these, of those concerned with legislation. To wit, the federal judge, the activist federal judge. The ostensibly interpretative becomes so easily the legislative, as Bork has been pointing out for years. Unlike the legislator or executive, the federal judge is able to rise above the necessities and compromises inherent in the political process. He does not have to run, neither does he serve a visible constituency. He is endowed with life tenure from the very beginning. He is not burdened with political responsibility. His powers are great. We need think only of the legalization of abortion, the desegregation of public places, the abolition of school prayers and reapportionment. These acts are inherently, inherently, it would seem to me, essentially legislative concerns, irrespective of whether we find them all good or whatever. But what would have required many years had these been left to the legislative branch or, branch or to the executive either, for that matter, it was the work of mere hours by comparison in the hands of the Supreme Court capable, obviously, of converting the interpretative into the legislative and vice versa. Law schools plainly are not blind. <clears throat> Critical legal studies in some of our oldest and greatest law schools seem to thrive. If the federal judge is potentially a very Hercules in the strength, skill, and dispatch with which he cleans the stables of American law and sets in motion novel features of social change and progress, then how better can a law school do the Lord's work than by preparing the minds of those budding Hercules? The creation of the national community, at least in the image of Governor Cuomo's familism, mutuality, reciprocality, sharing, and bleeding, stands a far better chance, some people believe, of actualization through the federal judge than through any imaginable Congress. We may expect that in the years ahead, as the idea of the state as community catches fire, a more and more charismatic federal judiciary. Jeremy Bentham will love it. Sitting as he does, cadaverously in morning attire and top hat in his University of London office even today, he will shake in toothless laughter and slap his osseous thighs, crying, vengeance is mine. <laughs> now to the concluding part. Despite the charms inherent in a national community or communitarian state, the idea does face, at the present time, some serious challenges or obstacles. We have grown accustomed to the welfare state in one form or other, and there is no real alternative to it in any event. <clears throat> the idea of the state as family, as community, as some form of togetherness, is, however, a different kettle of fish. The word community is high in level of usage, but low in level of meaning. As I have noted, it creates a sense of promise, a kind of habitual expectation that nothing short of the divine could possibly fulfill. Moreover, serious belief in Professor Dewey's and Governor Cuomo's great community requires a considerable degree of cognitive dissonance. 
we are forced to take seriously and literally such premises as the bankruptcy of the family, the more abundity of the church, and the decay of the village. We are all cognitively dissonant some of the time, but only a few people are cognitively dissonant all the time. The blunt fact, the emperor has no clothes on fact, is it by any simple process of verification or recourse to observation, the church is stronger than it has ever been, certainly stronger and broader in appeal than it was in the days of the founding fathers. There are indeed sectors of our society in which the family tie is absent or close to it, but no sensible people legislates for its total population on the basis of assumptions which are correct for relatively small minorities. Despite the wraiths and ghostly presences which the Robert Reichs and the Robert Bellas write about when they consider religion and kinship and concurrent society, these two institutions are very strong and we neglect them in our planning at our own peril. And so far as the village or town is concerned, if it too is a corpse awaiting burial, what were 3,000 journalists doing last winter tramping through the snows of Iowa and New Hampshire and then the sunny south? That's a first point to make. Very few people are constituted to live in cognitive dissonance all of the time. The same holds with respect to the 50 states and the cities and towns within them. Back in the 20s and 30s, intellectuals were prone to ape their French philosophic forebears and draw pictures of governors and mayors with donkey heads. Public administration as a career or as a curriculum in graduate schools was scaled pejoratively to these areas. Those who could went into federal administration, those who couldn't, state or local. The New Deal mentality scorned the intermediate long existent structures of states, counties, and cities preferring to create overnight alphabetical agencies specially designed to cut through or ignore intermediate bodies of authority and function. There was also, yet another instance of dissonance, the superstition that national administration is somehow cleaner, less prone to corruption, nobler, more rational and scientific, and administration in states and towns. Well, there couldn't be very uh, many Americans after the last 50 years who believe that nonsense anymore. A recent Brookings Institution study of 14 selected states over a period of years has found a health and buoyancy in their respective state governments greater, not less, as a result of federal revenue sharing and other forms of federal deployment. Far from hoarding the revenue to meet the demands of balanced budget each year, the money has gone, Brookings observes, to services, services on a generally high level of efficiency and imagination, social, cultural, educational, and recreational. There certainly needs to be national planning, national participation in social problems. But there is a vast difference between the planning that proceeds on the basis that the intermediate groups are more abundant and the planning that sees them as continuing viable realities still close to the hearts and minds of their members. Another difficulty the ideal of national community faces is the specter of bureaucracy. It is disingenuous for the Cuomos to talk of America as a family based on mutuality, sharing, compassion, and the like, without a word or two on the absolute, <clears throat> unavoidable and ever-expanding federal bureaucracy. It is easy to imagine disillusioned citizens saying, you promise community, but give us bureaucracy. As a people, we Americans are habitually Janus-faced about bureaucracy. 
We like what it can bring, but loathe bureaucracy itself. Damned bureaucracy is one word. We are just like an inverted cargo cult. We are glad to receive the cargo, but instead of praying to the distant cargo ships, we revile and curse them. Max Weber called the creeping bureaucracy of his day an iron cage filled with robots. Marx declared it an appalling parasitic growth. Tocqueville called bureaucracy the despotism democracies have most to fear. But for the apostles of national community, all this, like all the dissonant understanding of intermediate groups, dissolves into the lovely haze of rose-tinted glasses. The evil and danger of thick, heavy, congealing national bureaucracy is not that it threatens to become totalitarian in the Soviet or Nazi sense. No such totalitarianism has come into existence except on the basis of armed revolution and immediate affliction of terror. The evil and danger of bureaucracy are inseparable from the strangling, suffocating, enervating effects it has upon even the strongest and most vigorous minds. The alleged virtues of the family, village, and church become, when catapulted into a burgeoning bureaucracy, hollow, sterile mockeries of themselves. And it is fair to suggest once more that efforts to make the national state or any state in the image of the family or the village are as destined to bathos as would be efforts to make the family in the image of Pentagon. Finally, a marked change has come over American political and social thought during the last 15 or 20 years. From an essentially one ideology polity to it, the ideology of New Deal liberalism, we have become unmistakably poly-ideological. Currents of conservatism, neoconservatism, libertarianism, free market thinking, and the whole religio-moral orientation toward family, local community, and churchly values make the intellectual temper of the country decidedly different now from what it was down through the 50s and 60s. I don't think these currents will diminish or lessen. Add the rapidly growing phenomenon of the new eth ethnicity, the waves of Hispanics and Orientals, and the native pluralism of America is immensely enhanced. The majority of these recent ethnics is achievement of middle class status. Family ties are powerful in them, and so is religion. In a good pluralism, there is the same kind of unity that exists in true harmony in music, and harmony is, is a distinctly nobler form of music than mere unison. In conclusion, let us not forget the cyclical character of all political governments. It was the greatest of historian philosophers Polybius in the second century BC, who demonstrated in studies filling 40 books, only six of which have survived, the universal and unavoidable operation of cycles in governments and administrations. Cycles of power, types of power, centralization versus decentralization, monocratic versus democratic, and so on. Cycles, Polybius wrote, are as instinct in government no matter what breaks are attempted to stay their action as growth is in an organism. But, he said, looking at his cherished Roman Republic, then incomparably the model for the Mediterranean world, a truly mixed government can postpone eventual decay and decline. Postpone not eradicate cyclical change of decline and decay as well as genesis and development. Polybius saw a long future ahead for the Republic as it existed two centuries before Christ. In fact, the Republic survived a little more than one century before being swallowed up 
in the empire of the Caesars. Perhaps we shall do at least as well by faithfully applying Polybius's counsel on recognition of cycles and the advantages of mixed government, perhaps. But it wouldn't hurt to look up a poem written by one of the lesser poets of the 1920s Renaissance, lesser but still coruscating, one Arthur Gitterman, a poem in the form of a prayer to the God, <clears throat> to the God that looks out for children, fools, drunks, and the United States of America. Thank you. <laughs> I want to uh, thank you very much for enlightening us, for uh, provoking us, for pushing us uh, away from thoughts that we might have uh, grown too comfortable with. I want to tell you just how much I enjoyed that speech. I enjoyed it so much that as soon as I sat down there and realized you and I had a large problem, I quit worrying about the large problem so I could listen to your speech. The problem was that the gifts I was supposed to present you weren't up here. As soon as I saw the uh, empty easel, I realized that. But the efficient endowment staff has uh, now brought them up, so I can uh, present you with uh, two small tokens of our gratitude. The first is this uh, etching. It is uh, a print of an engraving that uh, hangs in the National Gallery of uh, Thomas Jefferson. And I hope it will hang on your wall and. Uh, remind you of this evening with the same kinds of fond memories we will take away with, Thank with you it. Thank so much. The second small token of our appreciation is uh, the volume of the Library of America that contains Thomas Jefferson's writings. This is the 20th volume of the Library of America. The Library of America publishes the work of America's foremost writers in a uniform edition and for those of you in our audience who are unaware of this, this is a series that has uh, been underwritten and made possible by the National Endowment. So we hope that, uh, that this too much. will will remind you of the evening. I not only want to uh, uh, thank our fine lecturer, but uh, uh, thank our audience too, and thank the private uh, donors that helped make this evening possible, the Bradley Foundation, the Earhart Foundation, Hallmark Cards, and the Olin Foundation. I hope that all of you will join us across the street at the National Museum of American History to uh, continue our celebration of this uh, notable event for all of us who, who do treasure the humanistic disciplines that uh, we at the endowment care about. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like more information on this program, you can contact the National Endowment for the Humanities at 1100 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20506.